Okay, thank you, and welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, Europe seminar at NUPI about the French election. So, after a very interesting French uh, election, uh, we, which uh, has been covered quite extensively uh, in Norway uh, and more extensively than, than usual. Uh, normally, in, in Norway, there are not so much attention uh, about France and French election, but this time it has been uh, covered a lot. And there is, of course, a very good reason for that. Uh, this election had. Uh, will have uh, implications for, for uh, Europe, for European integration and for European security. And it has also um, led to a small earthquake in, in French politics, uh, or maybe a, a small revolution, in, at least in political representation. Uh, and so what we, now we know that uh, Emmanuel Macron has won uh, the election, that he will be the president for, for the years to come. Uh, but what we are interested in is uh, to learn more about how French politics will look like under Macron in France uh, and what kind of implication it will have for Europe. Uh, and we are very pleased to have Professor uh, Christian Lequen to help us uh, with this uh, and to talk about um, the outcome of the election. Christian Lequen is a professor at CRI Sciences Po in Paris. Um, he has published extensively on uh, French foreign policy, on European integration, on French-Europe uh, relations, and also recently published a book on uh, French diplomatic practices. Uh, so before I give you the floor, I will just uh, say that this seminar is, is part of a series that we have that is funded by the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and it's also closely linked to a research project that we have funded by uh, the, the Research Council. And I will also inform you all that this seminar will be streamed. So, Christian, with no further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. and share with you some, uh, well, uh, first analysis about uh, this election taking place uh, last Sunday. But uh, let me, first of all, uh, thank Newpi for uh, inviting me, uh, his director, uh, uh, Ulf, and uh, also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway, because, uh, as Permit said, uh, there is a, a connection between the two uh, institutions for the organization of uh, this seminar. So it's done. France has a president hmm? uh, uh, elected uh, last Sunday with 66,06% of the, of the votes. Uh, it's the youngest uh, president uh, in the history of the Fifth Republic. He's 39 years old. And he was almost unknown by most of the French citizens three years ago. Uh, so what will happen to France? Uh, w this country with a, a long established tradition of politicians doing, uh, uh, well, long life career. It's not rare in France, uh, as in Italy, to be a politician for 30, 40 years, right? Uh, does it mean uh, the emergence of modernity uh, in the political system, uh, uh, also reflecting a change uh, in the expectation of the, of the societies? Well, those are uh, questions uh, I would like to address uh, uh, today. Uh, let me start with uh, four preliminary remarks uh, to uh, uh, stress the fact that uh, this presidential election went uh, against uh, conventional standards. First uh, 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 remark, uh, no representative of the traditional parties uh, were qualified for the second round of uh, this election. Uh, so um, uh, the, two, the two candidates which uh, were qualified came from non-conventional party for the first time in uh, the history of the, uh, of the Fifth uh, Republic. Uh, the two candidates uh, from the left and the, and, the, and, and the right were not qualified, so in a country where the left-right cleavage has been uh, a, a strong uh, uh, element of the political culture, it's very interesting. So the other candidate, Marine Le Pen, 
representing the right populist uh, party, Front National, uh, right populist with a very strong uh, social discourse, hmm? uh, defending the, uh, the welfare state. This is, uh, this is an important issue. Uh, well, uh, she got 33,94% of the vote. So it also means that one third of the French population uh, is now prepared to support uh, a far right uh, president. Okay? Uh, just to give you uh, a comparative data, when uh, Marine Le Pen's father, uh, Jean Marie Le Pen, uh, went against President Ch well, Jacques Chirac in 2002, he made 18% of the vote in the second round. So it's a double now, all right? Second, uh, new cleavages uh, goes, go beyond the traditional uh, left-right one. Uh, does not mean that uh, this uh, classic left-right cleavage has disappeared. And uh, maybe one uh, uh, element uh, to prove that is the uh, uh, high, high uh, abstention rate, more than 25% of the, of, the vo of the voters. And also the, the, the number of blank votes, extremely high, more than 10%, 11, uh, percent, okay? But uh, we see uh, clearly uh, that new cleavages are operating in, uh, in the French society. Uh, clearly there is a polarization, but uh, this is not the case only in, in France, between educated people and non-educated people. Uh, between big cities and uh, towns and countryside. Uh, also a geographical cleavage between uh, north east of the country on, and, and the south on one side, voting massively for uh, right-wing populist and the west of the country voting uh, for, uh, for Macron. Um, this is a difference between former rural uh, um, uh, areas, you know, who had in the 60s, uh, well, development, like Brittany, for instance, in the western part of the country, is an excellent example, uh, supporting Macron, and the northeast, uh, which has an old industrial tradition, but also with, uh, with a high level of, uh, of unemployment. Southeast uh, supporting uh, Le Pen, probably for different reasons, for uh, identity reasons, a strong rejection of uh, migration and, and multiculturalism. Third uh, remark in the campaign, uh, when you look at the arguments exchanged by the, by the candidate, one of the main arguments was acceptance of globalization on, on Europe on one side versus rejection of globalization and Europe on the other side. So, for the first time in the history of a presidential election, the EU has been uh, at the heart of, uh, of the debate. We talked about the EU all the time uh, during uh, this election. Macron uh, is uh, a man who is representing uh, those who are convinced that France has to adapt to the world and has to participate in uh, in the EU actively, Le Pen is representing a France which thinks that all the solutions to the problems must be based on the closure of borders. This is what she said roughly uh, during the campaign and the way she expressed that was very interesting. She said all the time, I am representing the French people. Je, je représente le peuple de France, that's what she said versus, versus uh, Monsieur Macron representing a globalized economy. She said, you are the representative of la finance mondialisée. This is what she said all the time, all the time in the, in the campaign. Fourth uh, remark, the, the campaign was very violent, I mean, uh, in the discourse until the end, until the very end. Uh, we are far from the political correctness to, that uh, traditional party leaders uh, from mainstream party used in, uh, in the past. As Donald Trump, and probably she took some uh, inspiration, 
uh, Marine Le Pen gave the tone of a very aggressive campaign using personal attacks uh, against Emmanuel Macron. Uh, she accused him of being a former banker uh, and, 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 and especially a banker from the bank Rothschild, you know, which is considered as the, well, the heart of capitalism uh, for Madame Le Pen and, and part of the French uh, society. And I, I don't know if you saw the uh, second debate uh, which took place last Wednesday, but it was, it was very offensive, very offensive. But at the end, um, I think Macron um, probably won from this debate because uh, he decided to answer on policy substance uh, rather than on, uh, well, political attacks and uh, formal things. And probably that, uh, that brought in some votes from uh, uh, part of the undecided uh, voters. So, now uh, the president is elected, but uh, the problems are starting, right? Uh, why? Because the young president will have to uh, uh, cope with uh, several challenges, domestic and, and uh, foreign challenges. But before I'm uh, talking about uh, these challenges, let me uh, say a word about uh, Emmanuel Macron. Who is he? He is uh, a middle-class boy, uh, born outside Paris. Uh, his father was a medical doctor. So he's typically what we call in France, la bourgeoisie province, right? So somebody uh, who uh, come from the middle class outside the, outside the capital. He was very good at school, and he went to Sciences Po, a very good university, as everybody knows. Uh, then uh, he decided to take the exam of the uh, National School uh, for Administration, ENA, and enter the treasury uh, as, a, as a civil servant. So a very classic French trajectory, right? Uh, as a student in Sciences Po, he was close from the Socialist Party section and from uh, the uh, left-wing union without, uh, I think, taking his card. Um, and this explains why uh, he went to the Elysee when uh, Hollande was, uh, was elected after a short experience at the Rothschild Bank. So a high civil servant with a political affiliation. This is very classic in the history of the elites uh, uh, under the, the Fifth Republic. Um, he was the protege of Hollande who offered him to become a minister, minister for economics, uh, without having any uh, uh, experience uh, as a politician. But again, this is something you can find uh, in the French system. Uh, you can be appointed minister uh, without, without uh, having any uh, parliamentary experience bef uh, before. When he was a minister, uh, he imposed several laws which went in the direction of liberalizing the economy uh, and found that uh, Hollande uh, did not reform enough, okay? Because Hollande, Hollande was uh, uh, pressured by the left of the, of the Socialist Party. So uh, when he got that, uh, the impression that Hollande did, will not run for a second mandate because of a low popularity, he decided to go. And he didn't know anything about the possible outcome, right? It was, it was a game, it was a game. Uh, he had uh, some conviction that the traditional uh, left-wing cleavage uh, well, uh, was a bit over and was challenged by other cleavages that I mentioned before. Um, he had also the conviction that the French state and the liberalization of the economy could find, could, uh, can find a form of compromise against the views of the traditional left. Okay, so this is why the traditional left uh, call him a social liberal which is a sort of insult uh, for, the, uh, for the traditional left. Uh, so he created with a couple of friends uh, from his age uh, 
uh, this movement, En Marche, move, uh, move forward, which immediately attracted people from direct origins and, and different generation, uh, all convinced by three things. First, France has to reform its economy. Second, France has to introduce more ethics in politics. And uh, finally, uh, there is no future for France outside the EU. Okay, so France needs to participate in a strong EU. So that's the basics uh, of the people who uh, are supporting, right from the beginning, Emmanuel Macron. So let me come now to the challenges. I'm, 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 I'm starting with the internal challenges. The first is a constitutional one. Macron will have to find a majority in the parliamentary election, which will be organized on the 11th and 18th of June. He says that his party is going to present candidates everywhere, I mean, in all constituency. Uh, most of them are new figures coming from the civil society, uh, not very known by, by the public. And here you have the first question. Are they going to succeed? Uh, because they do not have a lot of experience. Of course, some people will come from the Socialist Party, I mean, the, the, the right side of the Socialist Party, some also from the uh, Canon Républicain, the, the, the right wing, but most of them will be new faces. Well, the right wing party, Les Républicains, uh, which was very well prepared for the election, but uh, who did not succeed because of the accusation of misuse of money by the candidate, uh, François Fillon, if you look at their strategy now, they are concentrating all the efforts on the parliamentary election. And, uh, well, they have experience, they have experience, so maybe they can do well during this election, okay? If Macron wins a majority, then the situation will be uh, relatively, well, will be easier uh, for him. If he does not, then he will probably have to appoint uh, a, a prime minister from uh, the main party represented in the parliament and uh, uh, goes for a coalition uh, government, okay? What we call in France une cohabitation. This is the, the way we, we qualified it. So uh, this is the first, <coughs> the first chat that is he going to have a majority or not in, uh, in the parliament. Second, uh, reforming the economy. Uh, the priorities of Macron are, are concerning three domains. The first one is labor market, labor market. He is uh, frequently saying, and I'm glad to say that in Oslo, that uh, he has uh, uh, a Scandinavian inspiration for flexi security. This is, well, this is what he's saying all the time. Uh, which means uh, uh, more, more flexibility uh, for uh, the uh, uh, owners of enterprises uh, uh, to, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, sack people, but also more uh, uh, security for the employees when they want to get another job, okay? And this is, of course, very important in a country where you have 3,7 million unemployed and a high rate uh, for people under 26 years old. Second, uh, he wants to relaunch the foreign trade. Uh, currently, there is a, a deficit of 35 billion euros with some, uh, with some exceptions, agricultural products, where you have an accident, and uh, aeronautics, for instance. But for the rest, for the rest, uh, there is uh, a deficit of the foreign trade. Third, he wants to continue reducing the public deficit uh, 
to reach the EU target of 3% and wants to reduce the public debt, which currently represents 96% of the GDP. So a very, very high uh, public, public debt. For the first reform of the labour market, well, he said that he wants to rule through executive acts. So he doesn't want to go to Parliament. There is a possibility in the French constitution, we call it ordonnance in French, right? But, 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 uh, I'm not sure uh, he will be able to uh, uh, do that because uh, immediately we'll have to cope with a very strong opposition from the left. And I would like to remind you that the candidate of the left, Monsieur Mélenchon, well, one of the two candidates of the left, did... Uh, 17, well, he got 17 millions of votes at the first round of the, uh, of the election. And of course, he immediately said after Macron's election that he's entering, well, he, he, he used, used the word, we are entering resistance, resistance, right? So um, uh, he, it means that, uh, of course, the risk, the risk uh, uh, of having uh, uh, people in the streets uh, demonstrating against the reform of the, of the labor market, well, is something that Macron will have to take into consideration. What Macron thinks, and let's see if he's going to succeed or not, is that, uh, well, this is probably his expectation. His expectation is, well, you know, I am going to change the political culture in this country. And uh, um, that means that uh, I will try to go towards more consensus uh, and, uh, uh, well, uh, this is what he considers as modernity for, for the future of France, right? But uh, will it be compatible with a long political tradition of... Uh, Considering uh, democracy as complete, uh, that's, uh, of course, uh, 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 another question. I know many people in France who consider that consensus goes against democracy, that democracy is about complete, right? And this is probably what uh, the uh, Mélenchon's electorate thinks. Macron, and this is uh, also a big domestic internal challenge, will have also to reconnect French labor class with politics. His discourse uh, will be extremely important in a country where political discourse matters, right? Something striking for outsiders to see how political rhetoric, political discourse uh, uh, matters in, uh, in French uh, election. He was very cautious when he did his speech on, uh, on Sunday uh, after the uh, result, because he uh, he said something for in f well for the Le Pen's electorate, did, uh, l and and probably he will try uh, to make sure that uh, he's not going to marginalize Le Pen's uh, electorate in his uh, in his discourse. But uh, of course, he has no other alternative than uh, than maintaining the welfare state. And uh, here I see also big contradiction because uh, this is going uh, against uh, his idea that we have to reduce the public deficit. Public spending represents 56% of the GDP in France. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's more than uh, the percentage in Denmark, right? So he will have uh, uh, to reconnect the, the, the French labor class with politics. He will have to be cautious on uh, distribution, on public deficit, on uh, public spending, but he will have also to insist on education uh, and the question of adapting the education to the needs of the, of the labor market. According to PISA surveys, France is a country where you have today uh, one of the biggest polarization between the good schools and the bad schools. And this is a, a, a typical debate among French people, where are you going to put your kids? 
right? And uh, if you're going for middle class, well, you put your kid in some schools, which are not private schools. That's interesting, you know? They are, they are, they are state schools, but with a very strong polarization. And of course, this is going against the, the meritocratic narrative of the Republican school, which does not exist in practice anymore in France. Uh, so this is something Macron will have to, to take care. Uh, the challenge of education is very, very important. Uh, he will have to include it in his, uh, in his, in his uh, narrative. And uh, uh, another thing that he will have to put in his narrative is uh, the relation about the time. Uh, when, I, when I think about the time, I mean, when you look at Le Pen uh, discourse, it's a discourse which is mostly focused on the nostalgia of the past. French decline, etc., etc. When you look at Macron's discourse, it's expectation of the future, right? And from a discursive point of view, I think this is very important. It's very important to insist on that and to switch from this nostalgia of the past to, well, the expectation of the future. And I suspect this is why Macron was able to attract also a lot of young people, right? Because of this, uh, uh, well, projection in his discourse uh, towards, towards the future. What about the external challenges now? If you look at his program, you'll see that foreign policy is not the most elaborated part of his program. Um, the part which is really precise is EU politics. He is European and interested in Franco-German relationships, so he his first visit will be to uh, Angela Merkel, to the German Chancellor, but well, all, all the French presidents did it in the past. You know, uh, first visit you go to, to Berlin. So, but what is more important, he has a relatively precise European program, which was not the case uh, of Hollande and his Minister of Foreign Affairs, Fabius. If you look at uh, Fabius, uh, um, well, achievements, uh, probably it's in Europe, on, on EU politics, that you will find the less, right? So my impression is that uh, French foreign policy will be again very much concentrated around EU politics. What does it mean concretely? He's convinced about variable geometry. So uh, this is something he's going to propose to uh, Germany. Of course, it will be difficult for the Germans to take anything seriously before the elections of the Bundestag in September. But uh, this idea is to reinforce uh, multi-speed Europe, the Eurozone. He proposed a Minister of Finances for the Eurozone. He uh, proposed a budget for the Eurozone and some uh, parliamentary uh, institutions for the Eurozone without uh, saying precisely if it should be an, a specific parliament or, well, a, a form of uh, differentiation inside the current European Parliament. Well, of course, uh, <laughs> a big question, and this is in the, in the press now, uh, uh, what is acceptable for Germany, <laughs> right? And what is not? I think everything will depend on uh, the domestic economic reform. If uh, he's going in the direction of reducing the public deficit, um, so probably, probably uh, he will have uh, some uh, margin of maneuver to, uh, well, uh, uh, insist on uh, the necessity, for instance, to relaunch investments, etc., because this is, this is what he believes. He thinks that uh, uh, Europe has to uh, relaunch investments, so this is his Keynesian uh, part, if, you, if, I may, if I may say so. 
Uh, in Germany, probably there is a debate uh, about what is acceptable or not. I think uh, if the if uh, Martin Schulz, if the SPD is winning the election, of course, uh, SPD will probably be more inclined to go in this direction than uh, uh, the CDU. But there's good chances that Mrs. Merkel <laughs> wins this election and uh, uh, goes for a fourth uh, uh, mandate. Uh, what I understood is uh, inside the CDU, uh, you have a debate about those who think that, uh, well, we have to be flexible with France for a short time, and those who remain on the traditional budgetary orthodoxy, the Schäuble line, if I may speak so, right? So, um, but it's interesting, uh, uh, the FAZ, uh, the, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, uh, which is a conservative uh, newspaper, published an article a couple of days ago, and uh, they said, well, uh, we, uh, we, we have to support uh, the, f the um, Frankreich das we verdienen. This is the, the how they say that. So the 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 um, France that uh, uh, we are prepared to accept, you know, hmm? uh, and um, that means that uh, probably some people in Berlin are saying uh, now inside the CDU that uh, you need more flexibility on this uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, criteria than Schäuble uh, well accepted in the past. But it will also depend if Schäuble is a minister in the new government or not. Uh, well, nobody knows for the moment. Third uh, uh, element, um, he uh, well is very much in favor, of course, of uh, uh, trying to correct the external um, uh, negative effects of the market. And he said that he wants to renegotiate uh, part of the EU legislation, especially on seconded workers, uh, which means uh, probably tension with uh, some Central European countries, and Poland in particular. He was not very prudent during the campaign, and he, he criticized the anti-European stand of the Polish government, and, 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 and said in one speech that peace, so law and justice, uh, has probably connection with Marine Le Pen. Uh, that was very, very badly assessed in, uh, in Warsaw, uh, if you go on the website of the <laughs> Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you will see a statement from the Polish Ministry of, Fo of Foreign Affairs saying that the government of Poland has nothing to do with Marine Le Pen. So um, the uh, uh, image uh, in Warsaw uh, of Macron will have to be, uh, will have to be improved uh, in, uh, in the near future. Brexit, uh, he's supporting Barnier, uh, the, uh, and Barnier is supporting him. This is, uh, I saw a tweet uh, on Sunday evening from Barnier. Um, probably his mood and uh, the mood of the people who is around him uh, for European politics, like Sylvie Goulard, uh, who could be the next Minister of European Affairs, uh, is no particular gift to the UK on budgetary matters. Uh, Macron is somebody who will do his best to attract uh, financial companies uh, which uh, could uh, leave uh, the city uh, uh, because of Brexit. So he's, he's clear on that and said, well, if they want to come in Paris, well, they are welcome. But, well, he's not the only one doing that, you know. Uh, if you take the politicians from Luxembourg, from Netherlands, from uh, Ireland, uh, they're all going to London uh, and, 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 and try to have the same discourse in the, in the city. He also wants a renegotiation of the bilateral agreement on the uh, control of borders between uh, 
uh, UK and, uh, and, 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 and France, what we call the Touque agreements. Uh, well, because he thinks it could be a, a, a way to solve the uh, Calais jungle problem. Of course, this is independent from Brexit, but he will use it as a negotiating resource. All right? So the feeling in London is that he will be tough. And if you, if you uh, analyze the discourse of uh, the conservative uh, leaders in the UK, this is what they're saying all the time. You know, the French will be tough with us. Okay? This is also a way to um, uh, split the 27, all right? It's a negotiating strategy. Because if you say that the French will be tough, you mean that some other governments could be less tough, right? Well, and Brit Brits are usually very good diplomats. They have a long tradition. For the rest of the, of the foreign policy, uh, I don't see any big change uh, on the main issues. Sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Russia will probably remain on the same line. Policy vis-a-vis -vis Bashar el-Assad, same, uh, same line. Interestingly, he said uh, in a couple of discourse that he wants to come back to the De Gaulle Mitterrand legacy of independent France in foreign policy. When you say that in France, it means not following uh, the US so much. Uh, this, is, this is what it, uh, it means. But uh, so, because one typical accusation uh, of uh, parts of the Gaullist and parts of the socialist, I mean, the left part of the socialist, is that Sarkozy and Hollande's foreign policy followed too much the US on security issues. Okay? But uh, I have some doubts uh, when I look at his program and his advisors. They will probably keep, on, on, uh, well, stay on the, same, on the same line. So it would be more continuity than, uh, than change. And migration and, and refugees, I also don't think it will be very different uh, from his predecessors. So his uh, basic... Uh, uh, policy and discourse will be regulating flows. And he cannot give the impression of being too flexible uh, in this domain if you want to reconnect the labor class with uh, uh, normal politics. Because migration, this is a very sensitive issue among the poorest parts of the society and the uh, Le Pen's electorate. Finally, if we have to make some pronostic about his diplomacy, my impression is that he will give more priority to um, soft diplomacy, economic diplomacy. Because he's a kind of person, you know, uh, coming from the Ministry of, of, of Finance. This is, his, uh, uh, this is his background. This is his socialization. And very much believe that uh, France power in 2017 depends a lot from a recovery of its economy. This is the way he is, uh, he is uh, thinking. So economic diplomacy will be a priority, but not only economic diplomacy, also economic public diplomacy, communicating all the time on the image of reforms in France, on modernity, on what works, on high tech, all, this all these things. Uh, will be very important for him in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the future and in the construction, uh, the making of his uh, uh, foreign policy. So that's what uh, we can say more or less today is uh, after the election. <laughs> uh, everything uh, is, uh, is very open. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm prepared to answer all your questions and listen to your comments. Thank you so much, for Christian, for a very interesting presentation. I will open the floor for, uh, for questions. Anybody want to start? Yeah, Jakob? Uh, my question concerns uh, the topic that um, came uh, very high on the agenda towards the end of the presidential campaign in France, meaning uh, the uh, 
external influence on um, on uh, on the on the process and uh, more precisely the uh, hacking of the accounts and uh, the uh, role uh, attributed to Russia in this context. Couple of questions and then uh, series. I think so. Ja, jeg heter Harislev. <coughs> jeg kan klare meg uten mikrofon nå, men siden dere har dette systemet. Sorry. Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, I might have several ones, but uh, I start with one question. Uh, what uh, seems uh, rather interesting, or most interesting for foreigners, and uh, especially for Norwegians, that is what, uh, what foreign policy is the new president uh, 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 being uh, well in a position, and uh, what might be his aims? Uh, you mentioned the situation uh, concerning Brexit. What seems to be uh, your opinion? Uh, it is that he is coming in the same situation as uh, uh, Sarkozy, as he was uh, president. Uh, I know a small book, an excellent book, our of a colleague of you, uh, by the name of Pascal Boniface. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the thesis of Professor Boniface, that is that um, Sarkozy, in fact, he uh, was speaking much about breaks and changes and so on. But concerning foreign policies, politics, uh, he went on mainly in the same way, nevertheless. So one can ask, will that be the case now? But nevertheless, even if man imagine uh, that that will be the case, uh, what will be the continuity of, of the foreign policy which has been led? Because as you said, uh, uh, foreign politics was not so much emphasized uh, by uh, Foreign Minister uh, uh, Fabius, and uh, there are others who will serve to say uh, be operators on the international scene and uh, will uh, take positions so that uh, your new president will face probably quite a lot of new situations, uh, a difficult situation towards uh, England uh, and two other men uh, who are not so easy to treat with, I name them Putin and Trump. How will that be? Start with these two and then... Okay, okay. Well, first question about hacking. Uh, well, uh, you are referring to, um, uh, well, uh, a situation where uh, the uh, website and, uh, well, uh, the um <coughs> political party En Marche uh, has been hacked uh, uh, by somebody uh, from, well, outside uh, we don't know who uh, who did it we know that there was a hacking that's for sure but when a hacking appears in france well as it is the case probably in uh, many countries now we suspect immediately russia right um, that's the interesting part but on the other way we don't know to be to be frank, if it's uh, if it's Russia who is particularly responsible for this hacking, what we know is that uh, uh, Russia, uh, through um, well, uh, uh, a relatively open, soft uh, diplomacy, supported Le Pen, for sure, for sure, and. Uh, well, this is not very striking. Uh, Russia is uh, supporting in uh, many countries everything which goes against uh, mainstream, <laughs> well, uh, liberal agenda, you know what I mean. Um, I can just uh, refer to uh, my personal experience, something which has struck me a lot in the last uh, two months. Every week, every week, I was contacted by uh, the uh, news agency uh, Sputnik, who has a strong uh, office in Paris now, to uh, give evidence, to participate in debates, etc., etc. 
And uh, when I look at the people, you know, uh, uh, who, uh, for instance, they ask some public intellectuals to have, uh, well, their shows, etc. Well, most of them work were very close from the extreme and supporting, supporting sometimes explicitly Le Pen, right? So uh, there is a strong lobbying, uh, which means that Russia now is uh, very much going in the field of uh, uh, soft diplomacy, right? Not, not only hard diplomacy. Hmm? We had always the image of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Russia, well, very good in hard diplomacy, classic hard diplomacy. No, it's doing public diplomacy as well. Uh, so this is uh, the first uh, the first answer. Second answer, uh, yes, I know Pascal Boniface very well, he's a very good friend, and, but I disagree with him. Uh, so we have sometimes discussion together. <coughs> um, first of all, I don't think uh, there is a continuity uh, between Sarkozy and the, and the previous president. It is, it is at the Sarkozy time that we have a, a change in the, f in, in, in the paradigm of French uh, foreign policy. He went against the uh, traditional Gaullist paradigm, even if he's coming from Gaullist party, um, especially going back uh, to the uh, military command of NATO, uh, because Sarkozy was a man absolutely convinced that uh, France has to respect strictly Western alliance. Okay, which is a different with the Gaullist tradition, because in the Gaullist tradition, of course, you are in the Western alliance, but you try to play a special role inside, hmm? exceptionalism, right? And Hollande uh, follow, follow Sarkozy's uh, uh, line. There's no difference in the, in the foreign policy of Sarkozy and Hollande. The big change was between Chirac and uh, and Sarkozy in 2007. So my impression is that um, he, Macron, is going to follow this path, but he will uh, give more emphasis to EU politics. And this is the, this is the difference with, with Hollande, right? Uh, EU politics will become uh, more explicit in uh, his foreign policy, and it will probably mean not just uh, uh, finding compromises to manage crisis, etc., but uh, trying to propose new things, having a sort of proactive discourse again, which uh, totally miss in uh, in Hollande's uh, uh, five years, right? So uh, that that will be probably the the, the difference between. Uh, between the two, okay? But uh, we have to say also that Hollande didn't have, a, uh, well, a, a, an easy time because he, he came when all the crises were there. Yeah? He had to uh, cope with financial crisis, Eurozone crisis, second, the refugees crisis, and then, and then Brexit, okay? So my impression is that uh, uh, he will try to be proactive with the Germans, uh, but the question mark is, what are the Germans prepared to accept? That's the, uh, that's the, that's the point for the future. So nothing will be very clear uh, before the election uh, at the Bundestag in September. Mm? We will see after those elections in Germany. Mm? Okay, we'll have uh, one question over here. You okay? Joachim Nahum, I'm a senior advisor here at uh, Nupi. Thank you for an interesting um, talk. My question, um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, selecting a prime minister. Um, you mentioned the possibility of a coabattition where they would coincide with um, not winning the parliamentary elections, but seeing that this is uncharted territories, how do you select a candidate from the opposition if it's not clear who is the opposition? Uh, if you could say something about some of the prime ministerial candidates perhaps, and then just a second quick question on foreign policy. We've seen from, from Sarkozy to Hollande a relatively muscular um, French foreign policy. If you take Libya mm -hmm. and Mali, mm -hmm. uh, other 
examples where one has used um, military force as part of the, the foreign policy. Do you think this would continue uh, under Macron, um, or are we going to see something similar to the Obama doctrine on foreign policy? Uh, and coincidentally, a lot has been mentioned about Russia, but um, important to note also that we have this unprecedented situation of Obama actually endorsing Macron, uh, which I think is the first time a former US president explicitly endorsing a political candidate in another country's uh, election uh, in terms of that we live in uh, uncharted times uh, generally. So thank you. Actually, he um, asked uh, that question a bit. My name is Anita. I'm a journalist for India's The Week magazine. It was really to do with uh, Macron's NATO policy and would he support this kind of military interventions in different conflicts. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture, which was you covered a lot of ground for just uh, one day after the election. Okay. Uh, what about the prime minister? If I understood well what is going on in, uh, in negotiations now, uh, he is very tempted to take somebody coming from, uh, from the right. Okay? So we're talking about a man who, uh, uh, is, uh, well, who was close from Alain Juppé and who is the mayor of a big city, Le Havre, called Edouard Philippe, who is typically... Uh, a sort of uh, uh, right-wing liberal, you know, uh, not very far from uh, from uh, from Macron's uh, um, view of the world, and uh, he is going to appoint. Probably, he will appoint. Well, him or somebody else, because uh, I'm not sure uh, the decision is uh, is uh, is clear. Uh, rapidly. Uh, before uh, the 15th of May, right? Uh, the advantage of um, uh, appointing uh, somebody like Philippe is, uh, uh, of course, if Macron is uh, uh, getting a majority in the parliament, then he will be able to keep him, you know what I mean. If uh, but if the uh, Republicans, if the traditional right wins the majority, then he will have to renegotiate. He will have to renegotiate and they will probably not allow uh, Philippe to stay. Uh, he will have to take somebody uh, from, uh, uh, from the, well, the traditional Republican party and make a coalition agreement with them. That will take time, okay? So, um, uh, again, again, everything is linked to uh, the kind of majority we will get at the National Assembly. You're talking about the muscular <laughs> foreign policy, and you mean, uh, uh, and it's absolutely true, that uh, since Sarkozy, uh, France, uh, well, participates uh, a lot in... Uh, military operation abroad. You were uh, mentioning uh, Obama. One big regret uh, of Hollande is that Obama did not accept <laughs> a huge military intervention in August 2013 uh, against Bashar al-Assad, you know, when we had the first evidence on the use of chemical weapons. Well, it was not only Obama, because you remember David Cameron, who was the prime minister, of uh, Great Britain also uh, went to the House of Commons and didn't get uh, the, uh, the agreement from, uh, from the Conservative Party, from his uh, own majority. Uh, is he going to stay on the same line? F to be frank, I, um, I don't know, I don't know. Um, because he's going to focus much more on Europe, he's going to focus much more on economic diplomacy. My impression from uh, this muscular uh, foreign policy uh, is that it was also a way for France to compensate a relatively well, decrease of leadership 
in the economic domain, right? And uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis Germany, because the French were sure that there is one domain on which the Germans will not compete, that was military affairs, for obvious reasons, okay? So I'm not sure you will have to, uh, to uh, compensate so much now if he's really doing an active uh, uh, EU-centered uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign uh, policy. But on the other way, you know, um, there is a long tradition of uh, uh, considering military intervention as part of the diplomacy in France. You know, it's, it's part of, if you, if you, uh, uh, are interviewing diplomats, they will, they will tell you, well, you know, it's, it's part of diplomacy. Military intervention, sometimes we have to <coughs> do that uh, because uh, it's one of the, it's one of the tools we have uh, uh, when, uh, when we are doing a diplomacy. So uh, it's a structural element. This is what I want to insist on, you know. So um, I, uh, does not mean necessarily that uh, he, will, uh, he will refuse to intervene uh, in the future against Bashar al-Assad. It's, it's, it's a question mark. Um, NATO's military occupation, well, uh, he will probably um, uh, keep on the same line, so playing, uh, playing uh, uh, a role uh, uh, inside NATO, which is an active role, um, but also asking for uh, uh, the development in parallel of a European defense uh, uh, is in favor of having uh, uh, an autonomous headquarter, for instance, for, 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 for EU uh, defense and security. And uh, because Great Britain uh, <laughs> is... Great Britain was against because they, they refused duplication. Uh, of course, it becomes, uh, it, 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 it's, it's easier now. So um, I don't think he's going to change a lot on, uh, on, this, uh, on this issue of NATO solidarity. Hmm? Hello, my name is Kari Dongar. Um, I wanted to know, in, what, in your opinion, uh, what would be the worst case scenario after the parliamentary for Macron? There's another question on the front. My name is uh, Kjell Stomnes. I'm an independent private person here. I assume that uh, improvement of the economy and change of the labor market are critical factors for his presidency. How much time does he have before results have to show up? And secondly, if he doesn't succeed here, what do you believe will happen in French politics? Worst case scenario for him, a very strong, a very strong uh, uh, success of the right wing party Les Républicains in the next parliamentary election. That will be, he will be blocked because he will have no choice than uh, uh, doing a coalition uh, with them and uh, they will be terrible with him. All right, so, uh, that's the uh, that's the worst case for him, okay? Because it's 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 psychologically, it has been terrible for 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 the right wing party. They were prepared to win this election. It's not untrue to say that the the, the most elaborated program was Mac was uh, Fillon's program. It's true. It's true. They worked for years on this program. Okay. You can uh, um, uh, share the views or not. This is, uh, this is something different. Uh, my uh, uh, critique uh, to this program is uh, probably that the economic part of the program was too neoliberal in the classic sense of the term 
and we are now in a post neoliberal moment you know this is this is not something which is really acceptable by the by the citizen anymore uh, having that in uh, 1995 would have been okay you know but probably not in uh, in 2000 and, uh, and, uh, and 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 17 so psychologically most of uh, the leaders of the Republica were prepared to win, to win, and then came the Fillon's affair, okay? With a terrible mistake from Fillon, because uh, he had to resign. He had to resign, and I guess probably Juppé would have chance to win this election. Yes, <laughs> probably, probably. But that's what, this is not what happened. They were totally, um, uh, it was totally impossible for them to make campaign on the, on, on the field during the presidential election, you know? Because, uh, well, you, you have to say, well, we're going to change France, and immediately they said, well, <laughs> you're going to change France. So, so, so. And Mr. Fillon uh, uh, is getting uh, this, uh, very nasty family stories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What are you going to change? Is that? So it was very frustrating. So they will do all what they can to win, to win this parliamentary election. If they win, then the task will be extremely hard for for Emmanuel Macron. Uh, improvement of uh, of the economy. Uh, well, you're absolutely true. There is. Uh, um, there is a contradiction between the very ideas of reform, which necessitate years to get results, and the expectations. So, uh, but this is this is classic in politics. Hmm? Uh, the 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 expectation time is not the same than the implementation time of policies. You know what I mean? People expect more and more very quick results and uh, because it's it, it's sensitive as uh, well every uh, economic and social question in France well it's impossible to go too quickly you will have to consult you will have so it will take time so uh, uh, my impression is that uh, is, is, is it is not really possible to deliver before well three years and four years which mean the second uh, uh, midterm of his uh, of his mandate. If he does not succeed, it's excellent for Madame Le Pen, probably. Yeah. She she is going to uh, to increase her her support, and uh, this is probably her objective now: is that he uh, does not succeed and preparing uh, the next election of 2022. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is what, this is what Le Pen is, uh, is probably uh, uh, planning as a political strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. First, uh, Christian, let me thank you for coming here and sharing your thoughts. It's been uh, very interesting. I have three small uh, comments or questions. The first is related to, uh, first let me say that I think one of the most interesting things is the generational aspect to this. The fact that he's young uh, and uh, you started uh, this with your remark as well. So I'll return to this. But but f the first comment relates to the cleavages. Because as you said, the left-right dimension have been supplemented at least. with also, uh, let's say, pro-global versus local patriotic. But at the same time, when we listen to, this means if this is the cleavage that's going to be played out also into the future, it means somehow that Macron will have to fight Le Pen also in the future. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. So I just wonder if, if he will be then, this will be the lasting cleavage, but this would probably also spread over to other countries. So, so I just want to hear your reflection on that, or whether Macron tries to step back to see a multi spectred conflict cleavage somehow, instead of risking everything on this uh, global, local conflict uh, level. So that's the first point. And the second point relates to the gentleman's question from uh, in the back here on the time horizon. Because we could imagine 
that Macron could be the president of France for the next 10 years, right? Well, for, for we could or we could not? Um, no, we could. We could. Connor, yeah. he's mm -hmm. young and normally they try to be re-elected, et cetera. And that would provide a very long time horizon for making uh, significant reforms in Europe. And you also say that a part of his political project is to change the political culture, etc. But at the same time, he's in, in a very much in a hurry. So how, how will it play out the kind of the long, the long game compared to the short game? Mm. So, I think mm. so that would be a critical thing. And then finally, um, he's very young, but we also had a young politician coming into Italy, Renzi. And he was also doing pretty much the same thing as uh, Macron is doing. Basically saying, okay, I try to make some reforms at home and then go to Germany to get some help. He was unable to get the help from Germany and he was also unable to get do the reforms at home. <coughs> uh, and, uh, and I'm just curious about uh, uh, how Macron will then try to, probably he needs some allies to convince the Germans <coughs> to make some uh, concessions to France and to the, to the other European countries. So where will Macron look for supporters in Europe apart from Germany? Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolf. Three, three points. Um, first of all, uh, yes, you will have to, to, f to fight Le Pen uh, and fight again. Uh, no choice, uh, because uh, if he wants to change the political culture of the country, uh, he has to convince parts of the uh, Le Pen's electorate that the way Le Pen is considering politics uh, is wrong. You know what I mean. So uh, he, he has to be cautious uh, on that and not just forget Le Pen, you know, because uh, the election is done. Because behind Le Pen, it's a, a total other conception of what politics uh, should, should be, right? And uh, this uh, question of uh, uh, globalization versus uh, uh, anti-globalization is absolutely crucial. Uh, he has to find uh, among the Le Pen electorate a sort of uh, compromise discourse towards the Le Pen uh, electorate uh, saying that, uh, well, he, he's not, a, of course, he's not a, a, a sort of naive pro-globalization -globali guy. He knows that globalization has negative effects, seconded to workers, directive, etc. But uh, that there are also positive things in globalization, you know, and that at the end, well, you have you have no choice. You have to adapt to, you know. This is the message you will have to uh, 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 deliver uh, towards the, 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 the Le Pen electorate all the time, all the time. And uh, that, that will be hard, that will be hard. But he has no, he has no choice. He, 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 he must keep on it, he must keep on it, right? Um, your second uh, point is... Uh, uh, for me, the most important one. Uh, I have the impression that uh, this guy, uh, this president, because he is also uh, uh, coming from the administration, he's a, he is a rational bureaucrat, you know, at the, at the origins as well. Um, he's very much thinking in terms of long-term results for his country, you know. Uh, but uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you will have to differentiate clearly in his agenda what he keeps for the long term and what he's going to deliver even symbolically in the short term. He will have to deliver things symbolically in the short term. And I'm not sure that he really knows what he's going to keep for the long term and what he's going to uh, try to deliver in the short term, right? But uh, no, 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 again, no choice for him. He will have to uh, deliver in two years' time a certain number of things. If not, uh, it will be very difficult for him 
to, uh, to keep on the long-term agenda and maybe to be re-elected after five years. And you're absolutely right, he could be re-elected, you know, because he's 39, etc. cetera. Um, it will also very much depend uh, on the, the, the people he will have around him. Um, it will be very important for the trust of the society to have new faces. And uh, uh, here again, uh, we, uh, we see the problem of not getting the majority at the parliament. Because if he does not get the majority at the parliament, if the Republicans are doing very well, well, he will be obliged to take old faces, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so um, crucial, crucial for him. Help. Uh, in Europe, well, first of all, I think you will need the help of the German. Uh, the German will have to accept uh, a certain flexibility on, uh, on uh, macroeconomic policies. No? If, uh, if uh, Macron economic policies, yes, that's right, yes. So, uh, <laughs> If the German are, 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 are totally inflexible, it would be very difficult for him, very difficult for him. Alternative, well, I'm not sure there is a, there is a real alternative. Of course, he could, uh, if, uh, if Renzi is re-elected, then, well, there's good chances that uh, Renzi uh, will be re-elected in uh, uh, spring 2018. I don't think uh, Five Stars Movement will, will do so well. That's not my impression. Uh, uh, of course, he could play the game of Italy, but it's not enough. It's not enough. So if he does not have the support of, uh, of German politicians, then it would be extremely difficult for him. So this is why he's playing this card. And uh, uh, probably the lady is going to uh, uh, appoint as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sylvie Goulard, uh, will be the right person because she... Uh, She's a Germanophone. She knows Berlin very well. She uh, she speaks perfectly. She, well, she's very respected in Germany, etc. So she's going to do a lot of public diplomacy in uh, in uh, in Germany uh, to have again this uh, this Franco-German tandem. But the problem is that the level of distrust was so high in the in the last uh, five years that you have to reconnect also. Uh, the two, the two domestic scenes, right, together. Hmm? But I don't see, to, to, to answer your question, I don't see a lot of alternatives for him. Hmm? I have also three questions. The first, where, or actually what happened to, uh, to terrorism? The big issue, where Le Pen had all the possibilities with this young, not very experienced guy. Why was terrorism such a small issue in the debate? Second, what about the, the, the Muslim population? It seems like everything uh, with regard to what you are saying about educational system, about the ab an ability to create new jobs, the ability to to, to do something for the people in the Northeast, exactly the same with perhaps also behind terrorism. How will he address this issue? Because, I mean, terrorism is not going away. When I was visiting you, I was also visiting a lot of people from the, uh, from the radicalization milieu, you may say, in Paris. Very good, because they have a lot of things to study. And that they are very, very, very skeptical that uh, you have to do something fundamental with the French society. And the third is, I learned from American uh, scholars that actually one of the problems in the US is that globalization gives only advantages to business and to rich people. And in Scandinavia, uh, globalization has also through distributional systems in taxes, et cetera, et cetera, also give a lot of advantage, advantage to, uh, to working people. We have the same 
irradiation of all kinds of shoe and textile industry, but still we have something left. How was this in France? Was it was the, the French with 56% of GNP unable to redistribute some of the advantages of globalization, which definitely France also have had during all these years? Thank you. You can take one more, maybe Tor. Sure, sure, sure. Hello, I'm a journalist. Just a short follow-up on what you said about delivering results. There is one parameter that counts here, which felt, which made uh, Hollande not seek re-election. He didn't get the unemployment rate down. So Macron will have to prove his capacity to get that number down. And so th my question for you is, uh, is he able to actually benefit from what Hollande has been doing and what Macron was also involved in in uh, recreate or, or reshaping the uh, the law for the the uh, the employment uh, the the El Khomri law from from last year i mean there has been some changes and there m he might benefit from slow slow results coming out of the, those changes and and that social dialogue that Hollande actually started and Macron himself took part in when when he was in government and he can actually benefit from the results showing within a year or so could I add a few, uh, sure. few questions myself? Uh, it hasn't been important for France to play a global role. Uh, and I, I just wonder if uh, you say that Macron will give priority to, to, to the EU in his foreign policy. And I wonder if, if, uh, if this is also something that is important for him to show that France plays a role globally. And to what extent uh, this is important for the French people in order to see him as a successful president. So that's the first one. The other one is uh, the prospect for reform. Um, in case he has a majority uh, in the parliament, what will be the main challenge then? Will he manage to convince still uh, the trade unions? And, and uh, Because I guess it still will be protests in the streets. And how do you think that, uh, or do you think that, that will actually he will manage to get some kind of compromise, what he hopes for, um, that he will manage to get these reforms to through? Because it has been tried before also with the majority in the government, uh, in the par parliament, to, to, have, um, to do economic reforms uh, without success. Um, and the third thing is, is what about European defense? Because of course, if we give priority to changing of the Eurozone, um, but France has always been kind of one of the, um, the, the kind of uh, one that have pushed for a stronger European defense. And I wonder to what extent do you think he will push that forward or will he wait until he has managed to to do, to do some of the economic reforms. All right, thank you very much. Uh, quite a lot of <laughs> questions, <laughs> so I'll try to uh, uh, answer them. Um, starting with Kiel questions uh, on, uh, on terrorism. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there is a relative consensus on the fact that we have to fight terrorism. Mm -hmm. So, um, it has not been uh, a, a, a really conflictual issue because, uh, well, you know, um, most of the people agreed that uh, this is not acceptable. We had these uh, terrible attacks in 2015, 2016. Of course, Le Pen tried to, um, uh, to use it, but she was not extremely successful in instrumentalizing it, you know. What could have been uh, uh, beneficial for Le Pen would have been a, a, a massive terrorist attack uh, during, uh, during the campaign, which fortunately uh, did, uh, did not happen. Um, Muslim population, my impression is that uh, you are talking about the French citizens, hmm? uh, of course, uh, people who have a French passport, uh, uh, they supported him. Uh, they voted for him. And uh, during the campaign, uh, a couple of times, well, he did declaration, uh, he made declaration, uh, including something on the uh, Algerian war, which was clearly, clearly oriented towards the um, uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim population. Um, if he has this uh, discourse about, well, the future, about uh, 
giving the chances to the young people, etc. Well, immediately, of course, it, it, it has to include, it has to include uh, the, uh, the, the, the young Muslim population of the, of the, of the banlieue. And if it's doing uh, uh, reform in education, of course, immediately, it's also concerning this, uh, this population. Um, what he has to, what he will probably do is trying to avoid any uh, uh, automatic connection between Muslim population and terrorism. Hmm? Because this is what Le Pen, of course, wants. And, uh, well, this is what he has to avoid. And this is also not corresponding to the reality, of course. Even if there is a problem of radicalization, as in, uh, in, uh, many Western countries. Uh, it's difficult to know how many young French people are now in, uh, in Syria and Iraq, but probably around 800. Yeah, 800. Uh, yes, what you said about uh, benefits of globalization for the, for the, for the uh, working people, as you said, well, you're right, but this is a rational argument, you know what I mean. Uh, and it's true in France. One, one uh, I think it's one job on three depends on foreign investments in France. One job on three. And it's a country very open to foreign investments, right? Uh, but this is something which is not acceptable as a representation for uh, uh, many people, you know, who, 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 who believe that globalization is the devil, you know, and that uh, uh, you have to go to a closure on the border and everything will, uh, will be better. So uh, he has to change that, you know, and, uh, and probably he has to do a lot of pedagogy explaining that, uh, uh, well, globalization is not, uh, of course, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, something always positive, but uh, that uh, it also creates some uh, some uh, positive things. But will he succeed to make it believable by the people? You know, that's the uh, that's the uh, that's the that's the point. That's his, uh, his, 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 his challenge. So his discourse would be would be extremely uh, extremely uh, important, and also the way. Uh, um, People behave around him. You know, if you want to make globalization acceptable by people, you have to be very cautious on your own behavior as a member of the establishment. You know what I mean. Hmm? So, uh, if you have corruption affairs and things like that, immediately, immediately, uh, all discourse, all pedagogy you can do is down. Right. So, um, the way. People around him uh, are going to behave uh, will be extremely important. If he has some corruption affairs uh, among his ministers, and, uh, uh, terrible, terrible. So he has, he has to be very cautious on that. Um, unemployment. Well, this is the, uh, was a question from a lady journalist. Uh, well, this is, of course, uh, the uh, problem number one of the, of the French society, with high unemployment rate. But uh, <laughs> I don't think this is something you can solve in the short term, precisely. Uh, if you want to deliver improvement regarding employment, you need time. You need time. So question of employment is typically, from a rational point of view, a long-term question. It means that you will have to find other short-term <laughs> results, or you has, will have to, de to, to, to deliver on other issues in the short term, uh, because it will not be possible to change completely the labor market and the rate of uh, unemployment in two years' time. Well, 
low commodity low, he, uh, well, it has some effect. There's two things. Well, it's, it's difficult to know if the, if, if the health commodity low had effect. What we know is that uh, since six months, we have an increase of gross uh, again. So the, uh, the, the, the situation of gross is, uh, is, is going better. It's going better. But this is a general tendency all over the EU. Okay? But it will not, it will not change the El Comri law. During <coughs> the, uh, the campaign, it was the uh, uh, demand of Mélenchon to uh, give him his support. Mélenchon said, well, if you uh, accept to revise the El Khomri law, then maybe I can give you my support. And he was absolutely clear. He said, no, 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 no. And he was probably right on, the, on, on, uh, on that, right? Um, so um, he, will, uh, he will not revise the El Khomri law. He will try to uh, make other uh, measures going in the same direction, but uh, I'm not sure he could do that just with executive acts, with the, the ordonnance, because uh, that will not be acceptable, I think, by uh, especially uh, two, two, two big trade unions, CGT and Force Ouvrière. Uh, it would be very difficult for them to, uh, to accept this way. So. Um, uh, my impression is he will have to go through the parliament. Uh, but again, again, it depends which kind of majority he will, uh, he will get. Um, French leadership in the EU, yes, if you say to the French, you know, society, uh, you know, we recover as a, as a, as a, as a leading state in the EU, they will not dislike it, not at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what Sarkozy understood very well, you know, when, uh, when he intervened in crisis, etc. It was purely for, for his domestic audience. Uh, well, saying uh, uh, to his domestic audience, well, you know, uh, we, we solved the problems. We, 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 we are the leaders, you know. Uh, so um, this is things the French likes to hear, right? Uh, and uh, your, s your question about European defense, well, um, my impression is that he's going to follow the Bratislava agenda, okay? So all the, 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 uh, uh, trying to use the permanent structured uh, cooperation, which which is in the, in the Lisbon Treaty, and uh, trying to, uh, to develop uh, the idea of an autonomous headquarter for, uh, for EU. In parallel, he will have to uh, make sure that uh, there is an ad hoc agreement with the UK, because uh, no no choice when you are looking at uh, military resources. Uh, well, if, if, the, if, if the UK is not there anymore, uh, it's a big lack of, uh, of military resources. So uh, you will have to, uh, you will have probably to find a, a way to consolidate what exists already, the Lancaster House uh, uh, bilateral agreement uh, between France and, uh, and, uh, and the UK. But I'm, I'm very, I'm always very interested to hear the uh, people from the Ministry of Defense when they're talking about Brexit. Uh, I mean, the French Ministry of Defense, they, they, they all say, well, it will not change anything for us, you know. Uh, they're the only ones to say that, right? Uh, we're going to continue with the, with the Brits, three bilateral agreements, etc. Trade union, it will probably have the, the, the support of uh, one big uh, union, uh, which is CFDT, well, he has it uh, already, uh, which is now the union number one in the private sector. His problem will be with uh, CGT and, uh, and Force Ouvrière and uh, with the public sector. Well, 
the uh, my impression is that Hifi, Hifi has strong tensions, like strong social tensions. Uh, it will come more from the uh, from the public sector than from the private sector, because this is there where CGT and Force Ouvrière are strong, and this is also there where Macron uh, has a lot of uh, where uh, Mélenchon, so, sorry, has a, has a lot of support. So uh, we will have to be very cautious with. Uh, uh, well, uh, low middle range employees inside the public sector mm. Mm. who probably uh, do not trust him a lot. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. I think we have to end there. Uh, this was a very interesting seminar. We will follow, of course, French politics very closely, uh, especially when it comes to the parliamentary election. I can also tell you all if you're interested in French politics, we'll, we'll have a seminar on French anti-terrorist policy on Friday, uh, fighting terrorism the French way. Uh, so I welcome you back if you're interested in it. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. Thank you. <laughs>